Welcome everybody to TheUrbanOutlander.com. My name is Jordan. Thanks so much for checking out my video on YouTube. Check me out on TheUrbanOutlander.com. I don't just do vlogs. I also do blogs. That's blog with a B. Um, but check me out on Twitter, at Urban Outlander. I'm also on Facebook, The Urban Outlander. Um, check me out. Like me. Tweet. Whatever. I don't care. Let's talk about Outlander. Always happy to talk about Outlander. So however way you want to do it, whether it's on YouTube, the blog, on Twitter, I don't care. Let me know. I'm always interested to hear what you have to say. I haven't read the second book. I'm a DEA virgin. So all of my thoughts on the episode thus far are based in um, not having any sort of real inclination of what exactly is going to happen this season in season two. But um, I love Outlander so much and there's no limits to um, my interest and passion for the show and the book. I did read the first book. But I'm happy to always talk about it, so let me know what your thoughts are. Don't spoil too much for me, but let's start. Right off the bat, I feel like I'm still getting accustomed to this new season. This is only the third episode, and aside from the obvious, the settings are different, the costumes are different, that's evident, but I'm still kind of getting used to these new relationships between Claire, Jamie, a little bit with Murtaugh. The action and what drives the action has been so different than what we saw in season one. And there's so much more sort of planning and talking and kind of like the chess that we see in this third episode. The sort of setting up of characters and actions and plot. The pace is a little bit slower, but again, I think it's because obviously we know who the main characters are, Jamie, Claire, Murtaugh, and then we have this onslaught of new characters in this new world, in this new political setting of the time. I'm enjoying it, but I'm still kind of getting used to everything. I don't know, maybe if I had read the second book, I'd be a little bit more accustomed, but uh, I don't plan on reading it quite, quite yet. It'll happen soon, but I haven't read it yet. I'm looking forward to seeing where everything's going, and I feel like we're all still building up to some big moments, obviously the Battle of Culloden and um, some other uh, things that I don't even know what exactly could happen, but I'll find out, right? Funnily enough, Claire doesn't really look that much more pregnant. I know she's been in France for a few months now, but every time she's in one of those gowns, she looks pretty slim. And I don't know if it's the corsets that just sort of like keep everything tightly in and it just sort of flattens you out a little bit, but she doesn't really look that pregnant. Now the only shots in this episode where she is a little bit more pregnant looking is when she's in the gown and she's dressing Jamie and um, she's in that nightgown and she looks a little bit more pregnant there but it just keeps making me laugh because in episode two I thought well maybe they'll show her a little bit more pregnant in episode three and now I've seen episode three and I'm like well maybe they'll show her a little more pregnant in episode four and I haven't quite seen it yet. And all the shots where they needed to for publicity needed to take photos of her in those beautiful gowns I don't know, maybe they just didn't want to sell it with a pregnant belly. I'm not entirely sure, but she still needs to look a little bit more pregnant. Let's get on to some of the fun stuff. So Murtaugh getting it on with Suzette. Go for it, buddy. You know, if you need to relieve stress, let it happen. <laughs> We're not going to hold it against you. What you do in your time is yours. We're not going to ask too many questions. Keep it going. A little bit of development with Mary Hawkins. So it's established in this episode. She's destined to marry Black Jack Randall, right? So, I have so many questions. One, how old is Mary Hawkins supposed to be? She looks like she's about 14 years old or barely 16. And Jonathan Randall is older, so that kind of freaks me out a little bit. Um, I know it's pretty common back in that time to kind of get married real young, even to somebody who's much, much older. Um, and how does Alex? the brother play into all of this because I thought Mary and him would get together and why does she have to get married to the sadistic fuck of a brother whereas <laughs> the younger brother the nicer brother why is it that these girls have to sometimes just marry the wrong brother I just I'm curious how Alex is gonna play into this as well now that we've established his character as also being the nicer brother who's much sweeter but she's supposed to marry blackjack Hmm, so that's very curious and I really want to see all of that. Um, I'm really curious to see how that all plays out. And Mary Hawkins has confirmed my suspicion of what kind of woman would have been married to Blackjack. I thought, well, she's either the meek and submissive type 
Or she's a sadistic fuck just like Blackjack. And Mary Hawkins has now become the submissive, uh, meek one. So thank you for confirming my suspicion that what kind of woman could possibly marry Blackjack. Thanks, Mary. Getting on to episode three, useful occupations and deceptions. Well, there's a lot of deception in this episode, right? And for me, it was like, who exactly is telling the truth? And I know that's kind of a theme that's probably going to keep carrying on, but I felt like in this episode, it was a very apparent. So Prince Charles says that he's gained all of this financial support from these English aristocratic uh, sympathizers, and it's up to Jamie to find out whether or not he's telling the truth. Everybody, again, is just sort of playing the chess, putting people in positions, manipulating, deceiving. Um, another part is Jamie kind of keeping his own secrets from Claire. And why does he go to Maison Elise after he gets into an argument with her? I'm just still kind of like, why would Jamie go there after they've kind of had an argument? Why would he go there? I don't know. I mean, it's clear. I mean, thank God he brushes off the the prostitutes who are trying to get close to him, but I don't know, that felt a little bit strange to me. And Master Raymond, like, what's his relationship exactly with Count Saint Germain? I want to know what exactly these mutual interests are between the two, and like Claire kind of points out, you know, how I, is this how you treat all of your enemies, so friendly-like? I don't know, I mean, maybe he's a good guy, but I don't, I just can't totally trust Master Raymond yet. And also, I've noticed just so many, a little bit of mirroring and similarities between Master Raymond, Galus. I perhaps Master Raymond kind of fills that um, that hole in our hearts for Galus that we're still <laughs> missing because medicinal herbs is his thing, and as it was with Galus's. And I don't know, Galus had her own secrets, so a part of me is like, I think Master Raymond must as well, right? And we also see, obviously, Galus in Louise as well. So anyway, just my little Galus tangent there. Also in this episode, Jamie's needs versus Claire's needs. So they're still kind of, they both have similar needs and wants, right? Of course they want to start to stop the rebellion. But in this episode, it really kind of comes to a point where their needs are similar, but different too. Claire needs to find purpose. Jamie needs to feel support at home. He feels like he doesn't have a purpose. He has that good line in the in the scene where he says, you know, how do I find purpose? Where's my purpose at the end of the day when I come home? And I feel like between the two of them, there's all that friction, right? And there's that tension. When are they a team and when are they working separately from each other? And there are moments, especially at the end, where they're kind of come together, right? And they kind of They've figured out the mystery with the letters and who's funding, who exactly is funding the Jacobite Rebellion through Prince Charles. And, but then it kind of gets dulled by Claire's secret and Murtaugh's secret that they're keeping from Jamie. Um, I kind of liked that part where Murtaugh kind of gives Claire this look like, ugh, oh, utter fail Claire on not telling him about BJR. And I think Jamie's keeping his secrets from Claire just as much as she might have to keep that little Black Jack Randall secret from him. Oh, but by the way, she has to tell him, right? Because the Duke of Sandringham is going to come, and before he meets with him, she has to tell him what she knows. And so I'm wondering, how much is that going to change Jamie's mission? Um, like Murtaugh says, is he going to just give it all up and run over back to Scotland and seek his vengeance? Or will it kind of give him more of a purpose that maybe he's looking for? and trying to stop the rebellion or get the rebellion going and in a way to kind of vanquish Blackjack and the English. And also, yeah, I kind of miss like Jamie and Claire and all their lovely loviness and we haven't really seen that, but I think it's okay. I, I'm going to stick it out. I think it'll be worth the wait. We'll see. Thank you so much for checking out the video. My name's Jordan. Check me out on the urbanoutlander.com. Check me out on Twitter at urbanoutlander. Facebook, The Urban Outlander, like my page. Let me know what you think about this episode. Um, don't tell me too much about what happens in the book. I still want to watch the show and see what happens, but I'm happy to have you here and thank you so much.